Chapter 2, Punch Drunk The Vagos needed to fight the way others needed a drug fix. It didn't matter their target or their purpose. Winning or losing, the act brought relief. My nights blended together in a fog of full Nelsons and curled fists. My face rammed into the concrete floor until my teeth sliced open the flesh in my cheek. My eyes swelled shut and my boots left blood prints on the tile. Police never intervened because no victims called them. Amid the grunting and noise and hysterical shouting, I carefully punched until the violence became seamless, ordinary and expected. Punch, deflect. Punch, deflect. My life existed in flashes, light in the after midnight blackness. Any fear I had hardened with each mutual combat. And as a sharp pain jolted through my right shoulder and my head thundered, I developed rapport. So much, in fact, that Terrible invited me to the Victor Valley Chapter's 8th anniversary party at the Screaming Chicken Saloon in Devor, an unincorporated area of San Bernardino County, sandwiched between two freeways on Route 66. The bar, a renovated gas station from the 1940s, served only beer and wine, no hard liquor. Dust coated the inside. The bartenders looked weathered like fixtures from another era in need of a good wash. Dollar bills fluttered on the walls. A mounted bike fender jutted from the bar next to the neon V twin beer sign. More than 200 vogels crammed into the hot space and mingled with members of other chapters and support clubs. The bar expanded onto an outside patio complete with a horseshoes game area. Weapons and chains blurred around me. The stench of beer and urine assaulted my nostrils. Pink flyers advertising a breast cancer fundraiser littered the floor and stuck to the bottom of my boot. Women strutted around in bikinis. Some Vogels still wore their hamlets, reminiscent of World War II stormtroopers. Rows of bikes adorned with Valkyrie-like wings on the handlebars, mostly black, bronze, silver, red, and blue, lying the perimeter of the bar. Life for one percenter focused on motorcycles and the cannibalization of stolen or junked bike parts. Terrible squeezed through the bodies and headed my way with a mug of cold beer. He seemed particularly charged. Words tumbled out of him in rapid succession. He spoke of payback for drug dealers who had purchased goods with counterfeit bills. Human hunts he initiated on behalf of the Vagos to collect outstanding debts, assaults he'd committed, and the mangled faces and eye sockets he transformed in the bloody pulp. I turned up the volume on my recorder. Terrible made me nervous, not because he looked demonic, but also because he fought without provocation. Forgot threads of stories, ended conversations mid-sentence, and when he grew too stressed, punched his shadow people. But he presented opportunity, a way in to key players like Twist, Evago from the Victorville chapter, and Rhino, the sergeant of arms of the Victorville chapter, who both emerged from the dark portals in the screaming chicken toting bags of white powder and small caliber pistols tucked into their front pockets. Mentally, I checked off their sleeved arms, massive strides, and large gouges in rhino's lobes. Both penetrated me with flat, blank stares. I imagine they had suffered camouflage childhoods, subjected to emotional poverty, drenched in television violence, while their working class parents struggled to put food on the table. I knew them. People liked them. Conversations seemed futile. Neither was interested in discussing anything he didn't initiate. And it didn't matter anyway. Talking might only provoke them to punch. Besides, I was there to observe, record, and manipulate, not to fix them. I didn't know it that night, but I had just met two of the Vogel's most violent killers. By early January 2004, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department Criminal Intelligence Division contacted Special Agent John Carr of the Van Nuys Office of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives to inquire whether they might be able to use me in a more productive capacity. Carr and Special Agent Darren Koz Kozlowski met with the DEA and me at the SBSD Intel Office. Carr already had an informant working a Riverside County investigation into the Vogels. ATF and DEA reached an agreement and ATF signed me up. 
My handler would be the legendary Kaz, a federal undercover agent who had infiltrated the Vagos in 1997 and attained the rank of full patch member. He had used a CI like me to make the initial introduction into the gang, but only a month later, his investigation turned lethal. Kaz's CI had a fatal motorcycle accident on Hollywood Boulevard. The Vagos obtained the accident report from the LAPD and learned that the motorcycle's vehicle identification number identified it as a government issue. The Vagos interrogated the CI's wife, demanding to know why her husband had crashed a federal bike. The wife threatened with the slaughter of her family, revealed the CI's identity and disclosed that he had worked as an ATF informant. At the same time, she disclosed to the Vagos Kaz's business card that marked him as a federal agent. The Vagos made it their mission to eliminate Kaz. As the ATF scrambled to end the investigation in 1998, the Vagos learned that Kaz's undercover address terrorized him and threatened to kill him. Eventually, the ATF assigned members of its special response team armed with assault rifles to stake out Kaz's home. The Vagos backed off, but Kaz, undeterred, resumed undercover work. Now, as Kaz shook my hand, he laughed easily and warned, You do realize that this is all improvisation. He carefully explained my mission, to work deep undercover in Operation 22 Green. My goal, target the Vagos under the federal Vicar statute, violent crime in aid of racketeering, and identify the club's international officers as well as the officers for each chapter. What's your rank? My rank. What do you do for the Vagos? Hang around with them. Do you even know what that means? A flicker of doubt flashed across Kaz's face as he explained the club's rank and file structure. The goal of every hang around was to advance to prospect and eventually to full patch. The real talent assumed leadership roles, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, sergeant at arms. A gift of brute force might qualify a person for the club's elite enforcement unit. The guy would be a hitman or a fixer. Every outlaw club had such talent, Kaz explained. The SS for the outlaws, the filthy few, or death squad for the Hells Angels, the black t-shirt squad for the pagans, and the nomad chapter for the bandidos. The Vogels are different, Kaz warned. They prefer discretion. They wouldn't be as easy to identify, and they would be impossible to infiltrate without a bite. We'll work on that, Kaz assured me. Meanwhile, the Vagos' next planned run occurred at Lake Havasu in Arizona, located on the Colorado River, 60 miles south of Bullhead City. The desert lake, surrounded by red Otter Mountains and cliff walls, was actually a Colorado River reservoir created when the Parker Dam was completed in 1938. Home to the famed London Bridge and English village of shops and restaurants, the quaint resort town attracted a dangerous mix of college students and outlaws. Palm trees and lakeshore contrasted with hard-edged partying. The Havasu Run was a uniquely Vagal event coincided with the Laughlin Run. Still without a motorcycle, I rode in the RV with members of the Victorville chapter. We towed the bikes behind us. At least the RV provided some shelter from the blazing heat. Temperatures could soar over 100 degrees. The Hells Angels claimed Arizona and a large portion of the West Coast, but the club had not yet absorbed the Vagos, who dominated Southern California. Lake Havasu represented a significant territorial goal. Presence mattered more than strategy. But as a mere hangaround, I had little access to any important conversations. Instead, I spent long hours fetching beer and cigarettes for members, inflating, deflating, and inflating, again, headbutts, rubber bed, and providing instant entertainment. After a while, down on the ground, 22 push-ups took its toll. Exhausted and dehydrated and surrounded by crank-fueled bikers and prospects who blew meth in my face, I considered if prison might be a relief. The Vagos had commanded an entire hotel spilling into the parking lot with makeshift tents. Terrible, who just weeks before the run had been dubbed an official Vago prospect, melted in the heat. I shadowed him, hoping to learn what prospecting entailed. 
though the distinction between our two roles was marginal. I enjoyed slightly more sleep and could drink beer without permission. I dropped hints when I could that I had purchased a bike, a prize I knew would instantly elevate me in the members' eyes and make me eligible for promotion. Headbutt especially perked up in the Headbutt especially perked up at the announcement. He didn't need to know that it would be weeks before the ATF could wade through the bureaucratic red tape to deliver my bike. For days, I grabbed any space I could, patches of exposed tile, a curb, a couch, even a wall, and attempted restless sleep. Foot traffic jostled me awake. Elevated voices and sounds of sex rumbled through the RV and outside. Snippets of conversation floated my way, drug and gun trafficking, brewing trouble with the Hells Angels, but I could never actively listen. Instead, I blended in to the gray walls, up before dawn, my world a fuzzy distortion. Terrible guarded the camper, looking like some kind of lake creature, devil horns, slitted eyes, ink markings, an addict who could survive days without sleep or food, a model soldier motivated by a warped sense of mission and duty. He emitted a kind of dangerous energy that left me unsettled and tense. And as much as I hated the thought of spending more time with him, he could introduce me to key players. By day three of the run, just as the sun dipped over the lake and I had fetched my 22nd beer and terrible, looking wilted and sleep deprived, had danced on one leg for the last hour. Cycle, the chapter's president, announced Headbutt's advancement. We crammed inside the RV, members and prospects, and watched as Cycle handed Headbutt his center patch. He gave him 15 minutes to sew it to his cut. Terrible reached into his fanny pack and produced a needle and thread. Cycle offered up his old motorcycle. In the days following the Havasu run, Terrible invited me to the meth house he shared with Rhino and Twist. The cramped space teemed with half-naked women hovering in the door frames like racks of ribs, waiting to trade sex for drugs. Bodies moaned against the wall, near bowls of meth propped up on the floor, on the ball couch dusted with drug residue, and under the Nazi flag, the dark swat sticker cutting bladed shadows across the ceiling. Foil on the windows blocked the sunlight. The stench of wet stone and beer filled my nostrils. My eyes burned in the drug fog. AK-47s propped in plain view by the door, pit bulls lazed on the floor. Flies buzzed in their ears. Dog crap clumped near the drugs. Twist grunted at me and lit a glass pipe, his 380 caliber pistol in his belt. I hugged the wall, listening to skin, slapping, sucking sounds, and chatter like rare species of birds. In the semi-darkness, Rhino's shadow loomed large as he absently fondled a woman's breast, his buck knife winking from his waist. He collected women the way some people collect weapons. His old lady in the corner looked like a stain. Passarounds lined up for his attention, rail thin with sunken eyes. They waited for him in the hallway, in the bedroom, on the couch, on the floor. Rhino's girlfriend seemed unfazed. If I didn't want to spend many more mindless nights watching bodies flop around me in a drug-induced fog, I needed to make my move. Nerves shot through me, fear sharpened my edge. I've seen you before, Rhino nodded at me. Neither of us extended his hand. I would have committed my first affront had I initiated conversation with the full patch as a mere hangaround. I'm getting my bike in a month. I've already paid for it, I volunteered, and a strange stillness hung between us. Rhino's bloodshot eyes penetrated mine, and for what seemed like several torturous seconds, neither of us blinked. Then, as if I had passed some invisible test, he announced, I'd like to sponsor you. My tongue felt thick against the roof of my mouth. I'd be honored. Just like that, I was in. Maybe I looked too excited, too relieved, because a shadow crossed Rhino's face and he lowered his voice. Don't ever make me look stupid. Terrible and lighted me later. Stupid people, he had heard. Errant prospects, suspected informants, were drugged into the high desert, beaten, duct taped, and shot execution style. I promise not to be stupid. 
but becoming an official prospect, however, required a club vote at the next church meeting. As a hangaround, I had already acquired a cursory education in the Vagos' basic club hierarchy, codes, and the church protocol. The club masked criminal activities behind its bylaws and constitution, as well as its perverse interpretation of biblical laws. Club meetings, for instance, reserved for members only, were known as church. At these gatherings, full patch Vagos took care of business. A week later, on a cool Sunday evening, Psycho held church in his RV, parked in his driveway. Rhino, Spoon, Powder, Sonny, and Chains disappeared inside with several other members to discuss my fate. I grabbed a corner curb, sifted gravel through my fingers, and reflected on my week. My days so far had blended into each other, hours and hours of boredom, beer, pool, and mindless banter, waiting for opportunity, introduction, something to advance the investigation. And now terrible pace beside me, a hardcore gangster who would snap my neck in an instant if he knew my real identity. A door banged open, cycle framed in the harsh glare of the RV's porch bulb waved me inside. The camper, likely worth several hundred thousand dollars, served as a symbol of Psycho's success in the drug world. Trappings gave him the illusion of power. But I knew his haunted look too well. The paranoia that seized him in the dark made him perpetually cautious and restless and empty. Several members dressed in green headbands and dirty cuts formed a semicircle around me. Machine-like soldiers, well-trained, armed, and leashed of emotion. So you want to be a prospect? Psycho folded his arms across his chest, looking more like a marine sergeant than a criminal. Sounds of crickets cut through the tension. More than anything, my heart pounded. You know what that means? But before I could answer, he leaned close and whispered, You'll be a slave on call for any Vago 24-7. You could be asked to do anything. His tone implied business, sacrifice, prison, even death for the club. And if I decide one day I don't like you, I could order you run down in the street. I nodded. I knew Psycho many. I had heard rumors of kidnapping and torture committed in other chapters. If we have to go to war, Psycho paused, caught in the eyes of the others, you'd be expected to fight. You'd be expected to kill. I said nothing, but my heart hammered in my chest. Psycho handed me my bottom rocker. Sew it on your cuts when you get one. Later that night, my hand shook on the steering wheel as I drove to the slap shop bar where Spoon and other members had some advice for their new prospect. I couldn't believe it. Barely four months into the investigation and I was accepted, no questions asked. I felt like I lost my virginity. I had no bike, no vest, nothing but raw promise. No one asked me to complete an application. No one checked my criminal credentials. Unlike undercover government operatives who formed faked identities, bogus arrest records, credit reports, vehicle registration, and work history, I actually had a legitimate criminal background. Though for now, I would have to play a fake real criminal. Spoon ordered a beer and smoothed his long goatee. It skimmed his belly. A curtain of black hair draped around his shoulders. A bandana hid the top of his bald head. In the dim green glow, Spoon recited the prospect song and made me repeat it. I'm a Vago prospect. It's plain for all to see. I wish they'd hurry up and give me my patch so everyone will quit fucking with me. Hmm. <laughs> he gave me a notebook and a pencil, told me I should write it down and be prepared. I felt like a boy scout. He gave me a list of essential items I should carry in my prospect survival kit. Things like condoms, Tylenol, a sewing kit in case a prospect suddenly patched over. Tampons to plug up blood from a bullet wound, shoelaces, light bulbs, and Vicodin. Spoon ordered another beer and the evening stretched well into the wee hours of the morning. At dawn, I drove terrible home. Exhausted but wired, I vaguely registered that in three hours, I would have to report to Napa Auto Parts and begin my other job. Lizard and his entourage drove a few paces in front of us. Movement in the back seat distracted me as Lizard adjusted, wiggled, and exposed his bare ass in the rear window. What the hell was he doing? Of all the members I had met, Lizard seemed the most touched, the most out there, perpetually lost in an LSD flashback. In the real world, 
he probably would have been institutionalized, officially labeled insane and heavily medicated, but the Vagos considered him eccentric and not at all sociopathic. They wouldn't conceive of excising him for age or illness. And I quickly learned there were degrees of crazy among gangsters. Lizard wore a perfect mask, blending with darkness, unable to see what swirled around him. It didn't matter that he was lost. They all were. It didn't matter that Lizard was sick. They all were. All of them misfits among misfits. And I quickly learned there were degrees of crazy among gangsters. Lizard wore a perfect mask, blending with darkness, unable to see what swirled around him. It didn't matter that he was lost. They all were. It didn't matter that Lizard was sick. They all were. All of them misfits among misfits, trying hard to maintain some semblance of order amid dysfunction. Terrible opened the window. Wind rushed in. Lizard tossed something into the street. It landed with a splat. Spots slapped my windshield, brown and runny like. Shit! Terrible cupped a hand over his mouth and quickly rolled up his window. That motherfucker threw his shit at us. It took me a moment to process Terrible's insight. Not crazy or eccentric, but strangely, oddly appropriate. Finally, I stumbled into bed, pausing long enough to stuff my head with earplugs. It had proved too draining to travel the 40 miles from Upland to Victorville three or four times a week to hang around with the Vagos. So I secured a cheap apartment in Old Town Victorville, a Hispanic barrio close to the Vagos watering holes. But I had barely dozed off when I heard bam, bam, bam on my still security door. Less than two months later, pretrial services had paid me impromptu visits. I never shook off the fear of night visitors. Irritated, I tossed off my sheets, pulled on my shirt. Hercules zipped full speed the length of my apartment, barking maniacally at shadows and headlights. I glanced into the dark street expecting to see the police. Mag lights and red flashing wigwags, nothing. Stress zipped through me. I padded to the back door, cracked it open. Eerie silence unnerved me. Hercules whimpered as I climbed back into bed, but sleep eluded me. Something was out there, I just couldn't see it. For the next two hours, I listened to my heart thump. My alarm flashed at me, 6.30 a.m. I fumbled with my work clothes and opened up my front door. Uniforms huddled in the street. One officer knelt and drew chalk circles around bloodstains on the pavement. What happened, I managed. Relief shot through me. This wasn't about me. Having lived so long as a criminal, it was hard to remember I was now a good guy. You tell me. Sarcasm tugged at the officer's upper lip. I didn't see anything but I knew the officer didn't believe me. Of course you didn't. The officer pointed to the slugs in my door frame. Some kid got shot in the ass. Of course you didn't. The officer pointed to the slugs in my door frame. Some kid got shot in the ass. Then I realized what I had thought was pounding was actually gunfire. <laughs>